Heavenly Father, our sins are indeed many, and your mercies are more. Thank you for sending your Son, for experiencing and giving love to the unlovely, for bridging infinite chasms to make us your own for the experience of loss and pain and sorrow and anguish of soul, Lord Jesus, that you endured so that we might know you. We long to be like you. We long to love like you do. And we can only love others because you first loved us. And you loved us because of the supreme love that welled up within you. Love of the Father, love of the Son, love of the Holy Spirit, interacting with one another flowing out of your infinite being to us who are outsiders, totally undeserving. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. This is a tough one. This is a uh, challenging sermon, perhaps a little unusual in its format this morning. I want to give you a couple suggestions. Number one, listen quickly. Uh, There's more in our hearts that we can possibly cover this morning. Suggestion number two, um, don't make eye contact or keep your sunglasses on. Don't look at me. I'll try not to look at you. I'll try to keep my head down. Or uh, perhaps we'll forgive each other for making eye contact later. I want you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 11. Title of this message is Sending Out, and of course we're highlighting the sending out of a number of our friends, members of this body, to plant Gilbert Bible Church. And I want to reflect on the DNA of the church as we find it in the opening pages of church history in the book of Acts. And we're going to look at God's work at the church at Antioch. God's work at the church at Antioch. And we're going to pick up the story in Acts 11, but just to back up a little bit, we need to see that God is the one who established the church. Uh, We're going to see in an outline for this text this morning, God establishing the church, God growing the church, um, God replicating the church. And we see the the church in Antioch described here in Acts 11, beginning in verse 19. Read along with me. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And we had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. We see, first of all, that God established the church at Antioch. In Acts chapter 7, you may remember that Stephen preached a sermon and was stoned to death. Look over at Acts chapter 8, verse 1, at the conclusion of Stephen's sermon. I'm glad it's not the conclusion of all sermons. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Acts 8, 1 is God's accomplishment of Acts 1, 8. 
You will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts 8.1 begins the fulfillment of that very promise that God would do this gospel expansive work beyond Jerusalem. When I was a college student in East Tennessee, I lived in an old house, and that old house had wolf spiders. I very clearly remember killing a wolf spider the wrong way. This one was the size of about a half dollar, and I stepped on it, and the wolf spider had a very fuzzy back. It was not fuzz. It was hundreds and hundreds of baby wolf spiders. And when I stepped on Mama Wolf Spider, the house was now filled with other wolf spiders. Sometimes the church grows that way. <laughs> As they spread out, Gentiles began believing in the Lord and coming into the church. And that created an internal difficulty for the church in Jerusalem. They had experienced persecution from the outside, but now there was potential trouble on the inside. There is racial division. There is racial difficulty. Think back to Acts chapter 6 and how challenging it was already that there was a division between Greek-speaking Jews, Greek-cultured Jews, and Hebrew-speaking native Jerusalem Jews. Look, if the tension was already high between Jews who spoke other languages and the Jews native to Jerusalem, how do you think it would be if full-fledged Gentiles are making their way into the disciples' fellowship, introducing racial instability, fear, tension? In Acts chapter 11, we read that Peter himself had a difficult time with this. That is the vision of the unclean foods. It is a pork chop and lobster picnic blanket descending down from heaven. And Peter says, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. And God not only introduced all these unclean foods to the table, but importantly, there is a new purpose for Jew and Gentile relationships in God's unfolding redemptive plan. There would be no Jew and Gentile distinctions in the church. So the ability to eat all kinds of foods paved the way for table fellowship with people who ate all kinds of foods. So the church was going to be something new. Paul called this in Ephesians 2.15, one new man. Jew and Gentile together in one body, the church. And the first church that saw this radical new enterprise on full display was the church at Antioch. Look at verse 19, Acts chapter 11. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. They preached to Jews, and it was natural for the Jews from Jerusalem to find their countrymen who had the Old Testament, who were used to synagogue, who had a biblical worldview, and to preach Jesus the Messiah to them. But they were in Gentile territory. This Antioch was up the coast along the Mediterranean from Jerusalem. This was headed towards Europe from Jerusalem. But notice verse 20. There were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also. Greek, shorthand for anybody not a Jew, shorthand for Gentiles. This is remarkable. This is non-apostolic evangelism. These are just baby wolf spiders <laughs> scattered. They're just Christians fleeing persecution, going to new places. As some of them are going back to old places. This is, by the way, intentional Gentile evangelism. This isn't the Gentile god fearers who happen to make their way into Jerusalem, who happen to hear the truth preached by Jews. These are Gentiles who heard the gospel intentionally from Jews who sought them out. This is a first. This is pretty remarkable. This is the first church with a large Gentile population. This is a church full of first generation believers, many of whom are totally new to a biblical worldview. Notice in verse 20, it is men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Apparently, these are Jews who had lived in Gentile regions, who had come back to Jerusalem for the feast at Pentecost, heard and believed the gospel and then make their way back to their homelands, carrying the gospel and carrying it beyond the Jewish population. God is the one that established the church at Antioch, and he did it through the scattering that came by persecution. And he did it through normal, everyday Christians. 
Secondly, God grew the church at Antioch. We see this in verses 22 to 29. We'll work our way through that. Uh, There are at least five observable ways that God grew the church at Antioch. People, leaders, discipleship, teaching, and service. Notice first that God grew this church numerically. There was numerical growth. There were people added. Look at verse 24. Considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. People were added to the church. The church grew. Secondly, there were leaders that God grew the church by. We are introduced here to Barnabas in verse 22. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they, that is the church at Jerusalem, sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Now we have to go back to Acts 4.36 to discover who this Barnabas is. His name is Joseph. Barnabas is a nickname. It's a name that means son of encouragement. So this Joseph was so well known in the church at Jerusalem that the apostles named him son of encouragement. They saw him as one who could give wise, encouraging counsel, particularly in a church that was threatened by ethnic tensions. And they discover, oh, there's a primarily Gentile audience in a church up in Antioch. Whom are we going to send? Let's send the son of encouragement. Let's send Barnabas. There is significant Gentile conversion up there, infiltration into the church. We're going to need a wise, mature, big-hearted man. He had been in Jerusalem. He knew the tensions. He was handpicked by the elders, by the apostles there, to go meet the needs of this touchy situation in Antioch. And we're introduced to another leader in verse 25. Barnabas left for Tarsus to look for Saul. He was Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus was Saul's hometown. We'll come back to Saul and Barnabas' relationship in a moment. And then in chapter 13, we discover that there were other teachers there. Chapter 13, verse 1, there were at Antioch in the church there, prophets, plural, and teachers, plural. Barnabas, <clears throat> Simeon, Lucius, Menaean are some of those named there. So the church was growing in terms of numerical growth of people being added. The church was growing in terms of leaders of character, And the church was growing in terms of discipleship. Look at verse 23. When he, that is when Barnabas arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them, to give them courage, that they all have a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. Barnabas here is meeting new Christians and giving them courage and strength to walk with Christ to to grow in Him, to maintain fidelity to Him. Discipleship was in His heart. He's there to encourage the new believers. Look down at verse 25. He left for Tarsus to look for Saul. That's an interesting insight into Barnabas' heart for discipleship. Turn back to Acts chapter 9 and verse 26. When Saul came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he was a disciple. Why was the church in Jerusalem afraid of Saul? Because he had been a zealous persecutor of the church. And then he was radically converted by the Lord Jesus Christ. And they weren't quite sure. Is he uh, undercover? (laughs) Is he an enemy? Verse 27 of Acts 9, but Barnabas, Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road. He had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. So you have Barnabas' big hearted love for discipleship, taking the former enemy of the church and introducing him in fellowship and love to the leadership in Jerusalem. This heart of discipleship and Barnabas for new believers would come in handy in Antioch. Saul had gone back to his hometown, that is Tarsus. We learn that in Acts 9.30. And so that is where Barnabas went to get Paul. So Paul here was discipled and encouraged by Barnabas. We might call Barnabas the best biblical counselor in the early church. The church also grew by teaching. Look at verse 26 of Acts 11. 
When he found Saul, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they, that is Saul and Barnabas, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. There is teaching going on for a year from Barnabas and from Saul. Now consider Saul for a moment as a teacher. He was a student of the famed Jewish scholar Gamaliel. He was an, an Old Testament scholar. I'm reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew 13, 52, when he's describing the scribes. Those were the, the men given to the study of the scriptures. Remember in Matthew 23, Jesus leveled his woes against the scribes and the Pharisees. Why? Because knowing the scriptures, but remaining disobedient and unbelief, they were hypocrites. But Jesus says about a scribe in Matthew 13, 52, every scribe who becomes a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. What does that mean? A man who, had, who in unbelief and rejection of Messiah spent his entire life studying the Old Testament when he believes in Christ would have rich stores of treasure to share and to teach. What was Saul? Just that. Perhaps the world's best Old Testament scholar who believed and then had a rich treasure to draw from in his teaching about Christ and of course was used by God to write much of the New Testament. And then Acts 13.1 tells us there were prophets and teachers. The New Testament prophets are those who received direct revelation of New Testament doctrine from the Lord before the New Testament was inscripturated. And then teachers who were explaining biblical truth to God's people in the fledgling church. And if the church was going to be built up in the Ephesians 4 sense of being equipped and edified and matured to grow in discernment and the work of service and speaking the truth in love and growing into the measure of the stature of Christ, then it would need to be taught God's Word. God's Word meaning the Old Testament and New Testament era prophetic revelation, the truth that would eventually become our New Testament. This was foundational for the church. And notice in verse 26, the name change. It was there at Antioch that disciples were first called Christians. That is, you little Christs. It was a pejorative term that they embraced. And we embrace. There are a number of name changes in this section. Joseph was renamed by the apostles, son of encouragement, or Barnabas in 436. Saul gets renamed Paul in Acts 13.9. And here the disciples get renamed Little Christs. They all get a name change. And the church grows additionally in service. Look at verse 27. At this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit there would certainly be a great famine all over the world, and this take place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. So there's going to be a famine all over the inhabited world. Why send provision to Jerusalem? Why not Italy, Greece, Asia, Greenland? Because the church was in Jerusalem. Believers were there. There, there is a priority of generosity here. And, and consider the effects of a famine on the persecuted church. As particularly those Jews who would be desynagogued for following Messiah, whom the nation of Israel rejected. Christians who were Jews, who were removed from Jewish fellowship, were also removed from the protections the Romans gave for Jews. Eventually, Jew, uh, Jewish Christians were no longer allowed to be seen as a sect of Judaism. And they were therefore determined by the Roman Empire to be atheists and enemies of the state. What would a, a worldwide famine mean for suffering Christians? That they would be in dire need. And so the church at Antioch opened up their generous hearts with eagerness, sacrificially, to meet that pressing need. So God grew the church at Antioch. People, leaders, discipleship, teaching, and service. And thirdly, this morning, God replicated the church at Antioch. God replicated the church at Antioch. Look at Acts 11.30. And this they did. Sending it, sending the contribution in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So here we get an initial sending 
of Saul and Barnabas out from Antioch to go meet the pressing need in Jerusalem. Skip over to Acts 13. While they were ministering, verse 2, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And what unfolds in Acts 13, 1 and following to the, to the end of the book of Acts is the commissioning of these two out from Antioch to the task of establishing and strengthening local churches beyond the walls of that first sending church. Look at Acts 14, 26. Actually, start in verse 23. Just to highlight a couple of the things uh, that were happening in this evangelistic church planting endeavor. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So, so you see this evangelistic church planting endeavor included identifying, raising up, discipling, training, equipping, and commending qualified church leadership in those churches. And then in verse 26, from there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had accomplished. Did you catch that little throwback phrase to Antioch? This was a church that had commissioned them and sent them and prayed for them and supported them and then received reports back from them as they traveled through. Antioch truly was a gospel planting, sending, supporting church. And notice the church at Antioch was willing to part with its best biblical counselor and its best biblical scholar. That Old Testament scholar who then wrote much of the New Testament had an unbreakable love for his countrymen and an unshakable commission to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He was ready to meet a pressing need and to fulfill the great commission. To see Acts 1.8 carried through to the end of the age. Listen, the church at Antioch was not content simply to draw in a dream team of gifted people, but to build them up and send them out. Look, another way we could frame up this sermon outline this morning, draw in, build up, and send out. And this pattern was to define the church from the beginning by God's design. And sometimes the sending out happens like stepping on a wolf spider. The church gets persecuted, Christians spread. God's people find themselves in new environments. This church in Tempe was perhaps not planted in the right way or the best way, but it has still been an opportunity for God to work out His good purposes. Throughout church history, there have been disagreements and schisms and sins that have moved God's people to new places. A church may lose its first love and the lampstand is removed because it is no longer a platform for the light of the gospel and faithful believers scramble to make their way to another lampstand. But at other times, the church itself intentionally seeks to replicate itself, laboring to be established and built up in readiness to replicate. Churches have grown, installed qualified leaders, discipled and taught believers, served others, meeting pressing needs internally and outward and they have raised up, trained, and sent their best to new works. Drawing in, building up, sending out is in the DNA of the church from its inception. This is how God designed the expansion of the gospel to every tongue, tribe, nation, and people. The church is his program for the Great Commission. And listen, a given local church is never to be the destination of God's gospel mission, but a waypoint for God's gospel mission. We are to be a conduit for the progress of the gospel, not a cul-de-sac. We want to be in line with God's plan for his church. So drawing in, building up, sending out has been in the DNA of this church throughout its history. You have on the bulletin you received this morning the vision and purpose statement of this church. The glory of God, the cross of Christ, life-transforming work of the Holy Spirit, leading us to draw in, build up, and send out. And listen, there are many first-generation believers in this church, some of whom are now pastors in this church. And week after week, what do we experience? Uh, seeking to draw in 
and an equipping of the saints, a, a building up into maturity and usefulness in preparation to be sent out. And week in and week out, all of us are sent out to our workplaces, our campuses, our neighborhoods. Some in this body are sent out beyond. Wayman Lee has been training pastors on a number of continents. We support Massimo and Susanna Malika as they seek to, seek to see the church established and strengthened in a dark place in Genoa, Italy. And then we have raised up and sent out our very own to Papua New Guinea. One day to New Orleans and this day to Gilbert. Listen, the church at Antioch sent their best. They sent their number one biblical counselor and their number one biblical scholar. And this week, on the 21st anniversary of this church, we're sending out some of our very best. Two of our own shepherds, Tom Engstead and Josh Kelso. Both of them sons of encouragement. Both of them counselors, empathetic, wise, Humble, generous, compassionate. Both of them skilled in God's word. Tom, who has not only counseled nearly every one of us in this room, but has also trained an army of believers competent to counsel one another from God's word. And Josh, a gifted and skilled teacher of God's word. And Anne Inkstead and Julie Kelso. I'm going to read to you some of our best, the ones we're sending. Tom and Ann Ingstead, Tyler and Kendall Azeltine, and their tribe. It's going to be a lot of tribes. <laughs> Kevin and Alexis Berry, and tribe. Julie and Brad Conover, and Logan. Stephen and Veronica Gutierrez. Mike and Tanya Jolly, Josh and Julie Kelso. Jim and Sarah Kretz, Andrew and Savannah Kutz, Terry and Jocelyn Lewis, Morgan and Kathy Maddox, Jeff and Rebecca Maxwell, Tim and Tori Maxwell, Jason and Lisa McInturf, Phil and Rebecca Milan, Shane and Stephanie Moore, Rem and Sarah Mattia, Bob and Marilyn Myers, Jason and Alexis Myers, Matt and Steph Pagel, Sam and Ashley Pagel, and tribes of Pagels, <laughs> Jonathan and Lady, Lainey Philobus, Karis, Kiwis and her girls, Brandon and Jessica Rawlings, Jerome and Linda Redding, Larry and Trish Ross, Matt and Jen Ross, Cassandra Scholl, Josh and Jen Scouten, Phil Shade, Stephen Barb Shippey, Kenny and Bethy Sitton, Nate and Susie Snow, Miles and Chantel Taylor, Benjamin Terraberry, Andy and Erica Vernon, Jerry and Christy Warford, Kenny and Amy Williams, Christian and Jane Zwicky. And this is good. And this is hard. The seeds of this church plant go back a ways. The desire for and the planning for a church plant from here to the East Valley go back before my own days here. Janet and I came here in 2008. It was in 2007 that I first met Scott Maxwell in person, and he took me up to the top, the very tippy top of A Mountain in Tempe. And we just prayed together, scanning this valley 360 degrees, contemplating ministry in the desert, where there was very little faithful gospel witness and such a vast population center, such great need. Scott Maxwell shared with me on the top of a mountain in 2007 his own desire to see Grace Bible Church that was renting space on a Sunday night from a Lutheran church to multiply. And you can't plant a church until you are a church and established and strong. And you can't have a strong church without developing qualified leaders. And you can't have qualified leaders without discipling sheep. And that takes a long time. So there's a need to be established, to be built up so that you could replicate in this valley. Leadership development, teaching, discipleship, and maybe even a permanent physical location might help. 
But the desire for an East Valley church plant even predates that conversation with Scott on A Mountain. Tom Angstead has felt this need acutely, as many of our people here have come from the East Valley and have longed for, prayed for, for this ministry to replicate itself in that direction. There's a recognition of neighborhood after neighborhood with gospel need toward our east, a recognition of of many of our sheep coming from the east and many coming from far east, and an opportunity for people who live there to reach their neighbors in neighborhoods with a Mormon ward on every corner and two Mormon temples. There are also in the East Valley many sheep And professing Christians who have a hard time finding a church modeled on the pattern of the New Testament with qualified shepherds equipping the saints for the work of ministry. There are many sheep in the East Valley who don't even know exactly what to look for in a church. And this long-standing desire for a church plan in the East Valley even predates Tom Engstead's desires. Some of you came to this church more than 15 years ago already with a desire to see a good church birthed in Gilbert. And you've labored here in far away Tempe. You've prayed, you've waited longer than even the elders had it on our radar. Some of you have said, I guess we're never going to plant a church in Gilbert. And Tom and Ann came to this church to meet a pressing need of herding sheep. This fledgling body of mostly young believers went through severe hardship, testing and pruning in its early years. Tom told me this week that When he came here to meet that urgent need of caring for herding sheep in Tempe, a Gilbert church plant was the farthest thing from his mind. He just came to be a shepherd. There were more pressing immediate needs. And he also said, I never thought we would plant a church in Papua New Guinea before we planted a church in Gilbert. But the Lord's timing. In 2003, Tom went to Scottsdale to get Scott Maxwell. Just like the son of encouragement, Barnabas went to Tarsus to get Saul. Okay, maybe I'm drawing too many parallels from Acts 11. (laughs) That's just a little too far. Although, like Saul, Joseph, and the disciples all got their names changed to Paul, Barnabas, and Christians, so also East Valley Bible Church Tempe got its name changed to Grace Bible Church in 2006. And as this church stabilized, it began to grow again slowly. Under qualified shepherds, saints were being equipped, the word of God was being taught systematically, doctrine was being refined, believers were being discipled, leaders were being developed, and the desire to think beyond our own walls was growing. And yet the desire to meet the pressing needs of the East Valley was not enough. That desire must be met with ability. A local church established in the truth, mature enough to replicate itself and lend support to the planting of a new work was required. How do you get a church ready? How do you get a church ready to send cans, dods, and laymans to Papua New Guinea? How do you get a church ready to send Omri Miles and Emily Miles and a dozen others to New Orleans? How do you get a church ready to send a significant part of our own body to the East Valley to start a new work? How do you plant a church in Gilbert? In Scott Maxwell's words, you put your head down and be faithful to the New Testament ministry in front of you right here in this church. Preach the word, shepherd the sheep, grow in the truth and love, care for one another, equip the saints, train leaders. Following the New Testament script and God's blueprint for church growth. You can't microwave leaders. You can't overnight decide, oh, we ought to plant a church. Everybody's doing it. You can't fast track a church plant. So the elders of this church set out a long time ago to begin training men to lead, discipling sheep to grow, teaching the church the truth in preparation for a day like today. At significant cost. It's hard work. It's hard work behind the scenes to train men. That's not the flashy kind of product ministry that everybody sees but it is the critical ministry the elders here were committed to at great personal sacrifice. You need to know also this morning that it is not just a compelling need for gospel witness and faithful New Testament ecclesiology in the East Valley that drives this church plant. 
there's another significant factor. And it is the commitment of the pastors of this church to shepherd this church well. I'll refer you to Acts 20.28, 1 Peter 5.2, Colossians 1.28, and Hebrews 13.17. And I'll summarize them all here for you. Acts 20.28 and 1 Peter 5.2 say the elders are to shepherd the flock of God among you. That is, be with people, in proximity with people, and shepherd them. Colossians 1.28, every man complete in Christ. That is what we labor and strive for. Down to the individual level, every Christian under pastoral care being conformed to the image of Christ. And Hebrews 13, shepherds do this as those who give an account to the Lord. Put all these things together. You have proximity shepherding, individual shepherding under conformity to Christ, accountable individual proximity shepherding. That's what drives the pastors of this church. And these principles produce a commitment to a single location and physical gathering, not multiple locations and digital gatherings. They also shape the way the elders have thought about the size of this church. It means a sober assessment of our own gifts and abilities and the application of these principles has led the elders over the years to consider very carefully the answer to the question, what if we keep growing? What do we do? If we don't make plans to plant long ahead of the need to plant, we will inevitably compromise on the things that we have set out to be faithful to. So we expressed a desire to plant a church before we exceed our ability to know all of the sheep, to care for all of the sheep at an individual level with personalized discipleship and real care to shepherd among them. We wanted to plant before we exceeded our ability to gather together as a body. We have a very strong preference for one service. That is, the entire church gathered together visibly. Now, it is possible for faithful churches to have multiple services. It can be done well with that same intention, but the unity has to overcome the challenges presented by simply not being all together at the same time. We want to be together. So this shaped how we looked for a building The church was renting space for some 15 years. And the elders came up with a number, batted around a number of numbers, and this number is arbitrary. But but we ended up looking at some spaces and thinking, what number of people do we believe we could shepherd in the way we want to and not have an unwieldy number of shepherds? If we keep a, a proportion of shepherds to sheep that lets us know people, how many elders can you have? 45? 112? And here's what we came up with, a 700-seat auditorium seated at 80% capacity, which is the standard definition of full, is 560 people. That's a good-sized church in one service where you can see all the sheep, the sheep see each other, the sheep know their shepherds, and we believe shepherds can shepherd their sheep. That was our preference. It was arbitrary. But it helped us decide on this building and this auditorium in which you now sit. And it shaped how we thought about gifted shepherds like Josh Kelso, who had a desire to be trained and sent out. We weren't thinking, man, we need to get rid of Josh sooner rather than later. (laughs) But we also didn't want to stop thinking about sending him out. Couldn't not think about that. But our encouragement over the years, and particularly Scott's encouragement to Josh over the years, has been stay, be built up, get trained, Get experience. Be ready. So now let's think about what's happening today. Sad, happy. Tough, good. Tom and Josh and Tyler and a host of faithful servants and friends are branching out to a new adventure, a new hard work. You should hear their hearts. None of these servants are going because they think it's going to be convenient or easy. They know the challenges. They know the hard work that's ahead of them and in starting a new work. They know the hard, real thing it is to leave this body. And there's no easy way to send out beloved members of a local body. But our goal cannot be to protect what is easy, what is comfortable. Life and labor in Christ's church will be a train of painful separations. Why? Because this is not our home. This is our sojourn. This is our pilgrimage. This is our labor before the Lord as his gospel witnesses to the ends of the earth. If we kept everybody we loved, the gospel wouldn't go out. 
And if it didn't hurt, it means we weren't doing this love thing right. We don't want to send the dregs, send the best. And what happens when you send the best? You don't have them anymore. This is hard. And this is good. The sorrow we experience in sending away people we love from us to expand the gospel's reach, that sorrow is used by God to produce exceeding joys. What happens when our hearts, as Paul says in Colossians 2, become knit together in love? That separation isn't clean. It's not painless. Our lives are intertwined. We are members of one another and pulling those apart. It's uncomfortable. Tanya Jolly this week talked to me about the bearded iris. Much to my chagrin, it is not some bird in the South Pacific growing whiskers. It's a Midwest flower. She has grown them in Nebraska and Montana. They're large, beautiful, multicolored, intricate flowers. You can look them up later. Uh, they can be grown by seeds, but they propagate by rhizomes, those little tubers under the ground that spread out in every direction. And a, a good iris needs about 12 inches of space between other blooms. And once those rhizomes underground fill a planting area, they will continue to produce beautiful green foliage, but no flowers. To get flowers, you have to cut the rhizomes and replant them where they can have space to produce flowers again. And when you cut the tubes, apparently it's best to use a knife that doesn't cut cleanly, but leaves rough edges so that the rhizomes grow more vigorously. Now, Tanya was not pulling me aside just to provide me a random lecture on horticulture. <laughs> Although I have to admit, after reading about bearded irises, I want to grow some in my yard. Clearly, Tanya has been thinking about the pain about the loss, about the discomfort of, of being cut out from the flower bed and, and sent with this church plant. And she is confident in the good of the results, both for the East Valley and for Grace Bible Church in Tempe. I hope that any irises in my garden would serve as an Ebenezer to God's faithfulness in this endeavor. And probably prettier than a pile of stones. It's an apt illustration for this undertaking. Painful uprooting clears the way for expansive gospel growth here in Tempe and beyond us in this valley. Listen, this has been an encouragement to the elders as servants have stepped up in droves to meet needs in the church plant and as servants have stepped up in droves to backfill needs here in Tempe. It has been a tremendous encouragement. Thank you, saints, for doing that. One servant said, even if we have to unload chairs, I'm happy to do set up and tear down. Tom Angstead said, I never dreamed I would hear those words. And for those of you who remember, tear down and set up and the trailer and the chairs when it's 114 degrees. You understand the cost. And here so many have stepped up to meet pressing needs in areas of service. It has had the effect of an all hands on deck mindset in this church. It's thrilling. There still remain to be some reshuffling of responsibilities, some people taking on service roles, a, a reshuffling of small groups. There are adjustments still ahead of us to make. And listen, we need to have a realistic expectation about our separation. It will be hard and we will be truly separated from what we have loved. Gathering together under God's word, all together around the cross of Jesus Christ, experiencing life transformation by the Spirit together these faces for the glory of God on a Sunday morning. It would be naive to think that our friendships will remain just as they are. We're not going to see each other all the time. It would be naive to think that those friendships won't remain in some form or fashion in this life. In fact, Tom and Ann, it would be naive for you to think that all of us won't keep calling you when we need spiritual help. What is happy about losing from our regular gathering Jerry and Lori Lehman for years of service in Papua New Guinea? 
Or what's happy about losing Zach and Cassidy Can to that great task? Or Matt and Cameron Dodd and, and all of those little precious ones in tow? What was happy for Joel James in South Africa to lose his best shepherd and his eminent Old Testament scholar in Ryan Mitchell? Joel told us he couldn't do without Ryan in his ministry. And yet, that church sent Ryan to be a part of the work in Papua New Guinea. Because the loss of Ryan to Grace Fellowship in South Africa meant the populating of heaven's throne room with people from the Doe tribe in Papua New Guinea. And that's compelling. I think about others who have gone out from us, who've been drawn in, built up, and sent out from here in one way or another. People that we love and miss. And, and, and you can think of names and faces right now. What came to my mind was Brittany Thompson. She moved from here to Utah to do evangelistic work in Mormon country. And some of you still get her newsletters and pray for her. Adam Bossom in the Navy doing missionary enterprise somewhere in the South Pacific. The Herbransons, they went to Japan. Equipped to, to be believers in a, in a, in a gospel hostile environment. And then they went to a foreign mission field, California. And then there are many others you could name. And what do we learn in these separations? God has already demonstrated his ability to use these separations to accomplish better things. And if we're thinking rightly, we will remember that this life is short. And in a few short moments, we will be together again around the throne of the Lamb. And in the meantime, we would love to replicate our witness outward so that the throne room would be populated by people who would not hear the gospel except the gospel go out from us. And so we are willing to make sacrifices, eager, joyful to make sacrifices in order to see God do something eternally valuable. It was said of the Moravian missionaries, who sold themselves into Caribbean slavery because that was the only way to get the gospel to Caribbean islands. The European slave trade would not allow chaplains or missionaries on board slave ships, would not allow Christians on the island. So Moravian missionaries sold themselves into slavery, got on board the ships, preached the gospel, made it to the Caribbean, and ended their lives there in slavery so that people could know. And when they said goodbye to their families on the docks in Europe, those families said, may the lamb receive the reward of his suffering. That takes us right to the end of the story, doesn't it? Revelation chapter 5. I turn there as we close. Concentric circles of worship surrounding the throne, surrounding the lamb slain. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the one worthy to usher in all of God's future judgment against sinful earth dwellers and to usher in the new heavens and the new earth and the glories of heaven for all those who belong to him. And the worshipers surrounding Sing a new song, verse 9. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, that is to unfold God's future judgments. Only Jesus can do that. For you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross to purchase people. How do they get... From Gilbert, Santan Valley, to the throne room in Revelation 5. Gospel carrying proclaimers. Through God's program, the local church expanding to the ends of the earth. May the Lamb receive the reward of his suffering. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is hard to look on each other's faces. It's hard to look into eyes of people that we will not see on Sunday mornings for a really short time until we're all together around your throne. We long for that day. We labor for that day. Oh God, we pray for success in this endeavor. May your church thrive. May your church maintain fidelity to the gospel. May your church maintain fidelity to the scriptures. 
May your church maintain qualified leadership and biblical ordinances and church discipline and the one another's and the word taught systematically. God, we pray that your church would be the church. Pray that Grace Bible Church would not be a, a lampstand removed. Pray that Gilbert Bible Church would be birthed and would grow and be firmly established and would itself replicate one day, training up leaders and sending their best. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you have already brought visitors to the meetings and gatherings of Gilbert Bible Church. We pray that you would bring more and that you would equip qualified leaders and servants all up and down the church to faithfully lead and care for one another so that the body might cause the growth of that body for your glory in Jesus' name. <laughs>